How many lives could you save by opening the right window and at the same time closing the wrong windows? That's a question that Emmanuel Vanoli thinks about a lot. When his grandmother contracted coronavirus, she had to go into hospital and Emmanuel started to think about ways that he could help that hospital to reduce the spread of coronavirus. And Emmanuel Vanoli has a very particular set of skills, skills that he acquired over a long career. Skills that make him a nightmare for viruses like corona. That's my Liam Neeson impression. It's actually very good. It's a good, um, if the virus had let his grandmother go, that would have been the end of it. I can't keep that up that stupid. The point is, Emmanuel is really good at modeling the flow of fluids. Unlike Liam Neeson, Emmanuel doesn't work alone. He works for a company called Desalt Systems. And I should say at this point that Desalt Systems are paying for this video. You know, I only make videos about things that I find interesting, so I would have made this video anyway, but it's important to be transparent about these things. My grandmother, she's uh, 88 years, years old, and and uh, she gets infected by the COVID-19. And uh, I contacted the, the director of the hospital and, and tried to see with him if I can do anything. So we started, you know, to, to model the, the hospital. The starting point for Emmanuel in this case was actually a PDF of the floor plan of the hospital. And from that, you can create a 3D model. But there's, there's so much more to consider, like, uh, you know, uh, obviously windows and doors and ventilation, but also any sources of heat create convection current. So people, computers, radiators. It's actually incredibly complicated. But once you have that satisfactory 3D model, what do you do next? I put, you know, fake patients in each room and then I make them cough. So I saw, each, you know, I, I, I saw the animation, it's great. It's like a, a little mushroom cloud, right? That's someone coughing, is it? Okay. When Emmanuel ran his simulation on the current layout of the hospital, he discovered something really unfortunate. You've got this area of coronavirus patients and on the same floor, an area for other patients. And according to his model, air was flowing easily from the coronavirus area to the non-coronavirus area. So the task for Desalt Systems was then to find a solution for the hospital. And you know, not one that requires knocking down walls or building new walls. The easiest one was to open uh, windows, you know, in, in strategic position and create uh, some additional airflow that will block the propagation of the virus. The first one was in the middle of the biggest corridor of the floor to, to really, you know, cut the airflow in two ways and, and block uh, a part of the virus. And the second one was in between, you know, the COVID area and the safe one. And since, you know, the, uh, the hospital was in a, a low pressure situation compared to the external air, uh, because you only have extraction, uh, you are, you know, sucking fresh air from the outside. And then thanks to that, you can, you can block most of the contamination or the contaminated air in between the two areas. And this is basically the, the solution that the, the, the management of the hospital decided to follow. Isn't that a great outcome? Desalt Systems have worked with many hospitals now to give them similar insights. And I suppose that, like, this is the point of modeling. You know, with something like airflow, it's chaotic, it's hard to predict. You can't really figure out what it's gonna do just by looking at it. Like you might think to yourself, well, if I open this window, it will flow this way and this will happen. But it, it doesn't work like that. You, you have to do the modeling. You have to look at, like these are the things that the hospital can vary, these different windows, doors, and so on. Let's model every possible combination of those things and see what happens. And you discover through doing that, that actually it's this window and this window that changes the airflow in the way you need it to. After seeing the simulation results, you, you will say, oh yes, yeah, it's obvious, yeah, of course. Yeah. But in, in fact, yeah. nobody saw that before. So that's why it's, it's powerful and, and very easy to understand and share. I wanted to get to the point where I really understood how fluid flow is modeled, computational fluid dynamics. Like not to the point of being an expert, but just to the point where I have a really satisfying understanding of what it is. I mean, that's the basis of most of my videos really. But with modeling fluid flow, it turns out that actually the way it's done is verging on bizarre. There are many ways to model the motion of fluids and the ones that Desalt Systems uses are 
the popular ones, the ones that make sense for that particular problem. So I'll talk about those. You're actually doing two things. The first is you're tracking the motion of particles. Like I'm not talking about the atoms and molecules that make up the air. I mean, like when someone breathes or coughs or sneezes, these droplets of water, those particles, what are they doing as they move through the air? And actually this bit's pretty straightforward. So in your computer simulation, you're storing information about, let's say, thousands of particles. You can imagine it as a spreadsheet. It probably isn't, but you know, you've got this list of particles with their properties. How heavy is the particle? What's its velocity? What are the forces that the particle is feeling? And really, it's just Newtonian mechanics. So if you look at a particular particle, what are the forces? Well, it's got the, its weight, that's pulling the particle downwards, it's got buoyancy that's pulling the particle upwards, and it's got drag. The next step is to ask, where will all these particles be in a fraction of a second from now? So you're just moving forwards in time, like but just a little bit forward in time, where will they all be? And that's an easy question to answer because you've been tracking the velocities of these particles. And you know, speed equals distance over time, or velocity equals displacement over time, which we can rearrange to displacement equals velocity times time. So we can calculate the amount that the particle is displaced. In other words, how far does it move as the velocity of the particle, which is known, multiplied by this fraction of a second that we're jumping forward in time. Easy, sort of, except you might also have to worry about acceleration because maybe the velocity is changing over that tiny fraction of a second, in which case you need this equation, which you might be familiar with. It's got the acceleration term in there. Maybe the acceleration is changing over time as well, in which case you need a jerk term to add to the equation. Here it is. The thing to be aware of though is that the acceleration term has a t squared in it and the jerk term has a t cubed in it. And because we're moving just a tiny fraction of a second into the future, our t is very small. And if t is very small, then t squared is very, very small. And t cubed is very, very, very small. So this term is very close to zero. This term is quite close to zero. You'll almost certainly be able to ignore this one and probably this one too. So you've updated the positions of all the particles. You also need to update the velocities of all the particles because they're accelerating. You know what the acceleration is because you know the forces. So you update all these particles slightly into the future, and then you do it again, right? And these particles are incrementally moving through your simulation. So far, that's quite straightforward, except for that drag, because the drag force on the particle is related to the motion of the air around the particle. So this is the second thing that you have to do. You have to also model the flow of air. And this is where it gets bizarre. One common method for modeling the flow of fluids is called the Lattice-Boltzmann method. And the Lattice-Boltzmann method makes some remarkable assumptions about the world. So it's called the lattice Boltzmann method because you assume this lattice of points in space and you say that atoms and molecules are only allowed to exist at those lattice points. You also say that atoms and molecules are only allowed to have certain velocities. In the case of a two-dimensional model, which is a bit easier to understand visually, there are only nine possible allowed velocities. In 3D, it's 27, and actually there are some more exotic variations, but let's just look at the two-dimensional case. So you've got this lattice point here, and you've got a molecule on that lattice point, and there are nine possible velocities that it can have. And those velocities are specifically the velocities that will take that molecule from that lattice point to one of the eight surrounding lattice points, or leave it stationary in the middle, which is to say zero velocity, within the specific time step that you're using in your model, like we were using fractions of a second when we were tracking particles earlier. So it's really simple. Like the next increment in time, you just move the molecule from the lattice point to one of its neighboring ones, or leave it where it is, according to the velocity that it has at that moment in your model. And then the next thing you do, before moving to the next time interval is to actually deal with collisions. So the rule might be if two molecules are coming into a lattice point like this, then they'll leave 
like that. Or if they're coming in like this, they'll leave like that. Oh, and also you're not allowed to have more than one atom or molecule with the same velocity at the same lattice point. What I'm actually describing here is a precursor to the lattice Boltzmann method called the lattice gas automata method. What's remarkable is the this lattice gas automata model has real predictive power. Like it can behave in the same way that you'd expect a gas to when it's following the Navier-Stokes equations, which is wild really. There are some limitations to the lattice gas model and it's those limitations that the lattice Boltzmann method tries to address. And it does that by saying, you know, instead of like there either is or isn't an atom or molecule at this lattice point with this specific velocity, there either is or isn't an atom or molecule at this lattice point with this particular velocity, so that at any given moment in time, there'll be a collection of some molecules with some of the possible velocities at each lattice point. Instead, you say that there's a probability of a molecule at that lattice point having one of those nine possible velocities. And those probabilities change over time as atoms and molecules migrate around the lattice and collide with each other and so on. And so with the lattice Boltzmann method, these arrows can actually represent tens, hundreds, thousands of atoms and molecules, depending on the size of the lattice that you choose and the density of the fluid you're trying to model. But amazingly, this drastically oversimplified view of the world produces realistic results. Look, here's a fluid flowing around a cylinder. Here's a fluid flowing around two corners modeled by the lattice Boltzmann method. To link all that back to calculating the drag on a droplet of water that leaves someone's mouth, well, this droplet of water in your model will be near one of those lattice points in the lattice Boltzmann method of your model. To figure out what the direction of the airflow is at that point, you just average out all those velocity vectors, taking into account the probability of each one. And once you know the velocity of airflow at that point, you can calculate the drag. This is called Lagrangian particle tracking, by the way, if you want to put a name to it. Though in certain circumstances, you can do something much simpler. You can assume that the particles are neutrally buoyant. In other words, they never fall out, they never lag behind, they just perfectly follow the flow of air. And that can be an appropriate thing to do in certain circumstances. For example, the first hospital simulations were done in that way. And in that case, you're looking at the worst case scenario where the particles never fall out of the air, how far can they travel? If you're looking to investigate the effectiveness of face masks and face shields, it probably is best to go what I call full Lagrangian. We did some uh, face shield simulation to find some optimization, you know, to protect even uh, more the the receiver of the, the droplet, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I can say that, and uh, and that's why you know uh, when you when you are comparing you know the, the first design and the latest design of the face shield now you have some small small spoilers on top sometimes yeah. you have uh, some some spoilers uh, on the bottom the mask has two two good things uh, the first one is of course the fact that uh, you have a, quite a lot of amount of particles that will remain inside the mask. Yeah. So that's a good thing. And the second thing, which is pretty good, is the fact that you will slow down all the air and indeed mm -hmm. the particles you will emit. So at one point, you know, when, even if, if, you are, if you are coughing with a mask, the, the, the aerosol you will emit will, re, will remain close to you. And at one point, as you mentioned a bit earlier, the convection of your body will more propagate the particles, you know, to the top. That's something I hadn't considered before. By wearing a face mask, you slow down the particles leaving your body so that they stay close to your body for longer and they have a chance to be convected upwards away from the people around you in a process powered by your own body heat. A really big thank you to Desalt Systems. They don't just work with hospitals, they work with schools, music venues, all sorts of different clients. You know, around the world, we're in different states of lockdown. Some things are open, some things are closed. Imagine if venues like cinemas, theatres, restaurants modelled the flow of air around their buildings in a similar way and they could figure out ways to mitigate the spread of coronavirus through the airborne route. 
maybe these venues could open sooner than expected. Desktop systems don't just model airflow, they do all sorts of really interesting modeling stuff. In fact, they told me about one completely different thing that they do that I thought was really interesting. So I'm gonna make another video about that in a few weeks time, so look out for it. And oh, finally, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know, Emmanuel's grandmother made a full recovery. You know, it's creating a, a, a very nice momentum and, and exchange between uh, the doctors and, uh, and the engineers. Uh, and, and, and it's something very valuable because it was something that was not done before. Be curious, be, yeah. be smart and, and share with the other. That, that's, yeah. that Absolutely. was very positive, you know, last year. Um, yeah. yeah. And it, uh, to me, it changed my life. Yeah. 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 Great. That's, a, that's great. I'm gonna, that's, <laughs> that will be the final word of the video will be from you saying that.